I would like to give the floor to our friend Gopa Kumar. So, yes, yourself. Uh, so Gopa is a legal advisor to the Third World uh, Network. So Gopa, floor is yours. There is this. Um, thank you, Carlos. But uh, there is a small correction. So it's not about India, but uh, generally looking at uh, access to medicine issues. <coughs> So let me start with uh, thanking the organizers for providing me this opportunity. Uh, and in the next uh, 15 minutes, basically I will tr uh, make an attempt uh, uh, to provide a snapshot of developments on IP issues related to access to affordable health products, as well as certain issues related to the development policy space in the light of uh, ever-expanding frontiers of uh, IP, basically known as the IP maximalist agenda. <coughs> So uh, let me start with the some silver lines, uh, which is uh, which is in a way it's uh, very infancy, uh, infant stage, but has the potential to change the business as usual approach to IP and access to medicine at the global level. So let me uh, spend some time on two of those uh, developments. Uh, the first one is the uh, UNDP uh, appointed a global commission on law and HIV AIDS. This commission consists of around 14 eminent individuals acting in their individual capacity. And this commission came out with its report in last July, and which basically recommended for the suspension of the TRIPS agreement. Let me quote the recommendation. The UN Secretary General must convene a neutral high-level body to review and assess proposals and recommended a new intellectual property regime for pharmaceutical products. Pending this review, the WTO members must suspend the TRIPS as it relates to essential pharmaceutical products for low- and middle-income countries. So this recommendation, you know, people would have laughed at, uh, would have made it like a few years ago. But now this recommendation has come from an international commission appointed by the UNDP. So the commission further goes, uh, further makes another statement which is also relevant for us. Which say, where the commission states that the TRIPS has failed to encourage and reward the kind of innovation that makes more effective pharmaceutical products available to the poor, including for neglected diseases. So this is a significant development because for the first time after almost 17 years of the conclusion of the TRIPS agreement, a panel appointed by an international organization boldly recommends for overhauling of international IP regime, taking into consideration of human rights and public health. In the past, such attempts like CAPR or CAPH stress mainly on the use of flexibilities, but they don't make such a bold recommendation. Academy and civil society are very well aware of those legal, political and institutional constraints in the actual use of TRIPS flexibilities. So let us break the OMERTA code on TRIPS and take forward the recommendation of the Global Commission. It's important to build up further evidence to interrogate the TRIPS agreement. I understand one of the expected outcome of this Congress is a public research and action agenda. Hence, I, I suggest that an independent uh, panel of academia and civil society should conduct a stock taking of the functioning of trip, uh, TRIPS agreement. So this should be done at a holistic manner, uh, looking at ac not only access to medicine and access to knowledge, but also the uh, the issues of uh, development like industrial development, transfer of technology, etc. So the second development uh, worth mentioning here is the CEWG recommendation. WHO appointed a consultative expert working group on research and development, mainly looking at the financing and coordination mechanism. This panel recommended a binding legal instrument to address the issue of unmet R&D needs of developing countries. According to CEWG recommendation, one of the objectives of this instrument should be looking at generating R&D outcomes as public good and freely available for further research and production. So this is a, again another breakthrough, which is looking at a uh, situation where the R&D outcomes are available out of you know, legal and contractual uh, restrictions. And it's freely available and open knowledge innovation model. Um, however, the CEWG roadmap uh, set out uh, set a uh, set, uh, you know uh, CEWG uh, set a roadmap for IP left, especially IP free R&D paradigm for unmet needs, biomedical R&D needs of developing countries. 
However, during the last week of November, developed countries taking advantage of the prevailing confusion among developing countries could, su uh, could succeed in delaying the decision to start, uh, start a process towards the launching of a treaty negotiation. However, the develop, uh, developed countries led by EU and US uh, failed in their attempt to kill the idea of R&D treaty, which is still uh, well within the agenda of WHO and it will take a few more years, around three years, uh, to take a decision on this issue. However, it's important for academia and civil society organizations um, to work towards the realization of R&D paradigm for an IP-free um, R&D paradigm. So now, uh, we also have uh, some encouraging statements coming out of the BRICS and IPSA summits. But the important task is that how to translate these um, you know, wonderful uh, political statesmen in the reality. So we are yet to see such changes, concrete changes on the ground. So some of the progressive development which uh, occurred in the last year. The first one is the uh, least developed countries submitted a request under Article 66 of the TRIPS Agreement for the extension of the waiver of TRIPS uh, obligation. And also this uh, request also includes the exemption of application of TRIPS agreement including a 2016 deadline for the implementation of the product patent regime. So most of us know that the de uh, least developed countries need not implement TRIPS uh, obligations uh, related to pharmaceutical patents until uh, 2016. So the new request asks for an unspecific duration for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for this particular waiver. So in the upcoming meeting of the TRIPS Council, I think it's going to happen in the next February, uh, this issue is going to come up for discussion. And there is a need for much more mobilization on this issue because in the, uh, to avoid the past experiences where developed countries in a way extracted more trade concession to give this waiver. So it's important for us to focus on this issue in the coming days. Second uh, is the re-emergence of the use of compulsory licenses to address access to medicine. In the past seven months, India, Indonesia, Ecuador use compulsory licenses. Um, compulsory license, India's compulsory license needs a special mention because it may be the first time in a developing country compulsory license is used at the request of a generic company. In developing countries, compulsory license generally invoked by the government under the government use provision and not through a quasi judicial process. In India, a private pharmaceutical generic company approached the uh, patent office citing the high prices of the patented medicine as a ground to issue a compulsory license. And through that process, uh, the company obtained a license on the ground that the uh, patent holder failed to provide uh, the demand in the market because of the high prices and various other grounds also. But this is an important, uh, important uh, development because this can be used in many other countries to, to, to push back the patent monopoly and abuse of patent monopoly by charging higher prices. And another important feature is that this, pay, uh, this compulsory license is may, uh, granted on a cancer drug. So most of the compulsory license granted in the 2000, you know, after the adoption of the Doha Declaration is mainly in the area of, uh, for the treatment of HIV AIDS medicines. But this uh, compulsory license granted on a uh, cancer uh, drug. So this what noting. So let me now also, uh, also um, cite, uh, spend some time on the uh, Kenyan judgment. So this is a judgment is a, is a historical, uh, resulted in a historical judgment where the High Court of Kenya um, held that the anti-counterfeit uh, provision or the anti-counterfeit legislation um, legislation basically violates the right to health. So let me just quote the, uh, from the judgment. According to judge, the definition of counterfeit in section 2 of the act is likely to be read as including generic medication. I would therefore agree with the amicus that that Thus, it is likely adversely affect the manufacturer would, sorry, um, the amicus that uh, the, defi the definition would encompass generic medicine produced in Kenya and elsewhere. Thus, it is likely uh, adversely affects the manufacturer, sale and distribution of generic equivalents of patented drugs. Thus, this would affect the availability of generic drugs and thus pose a real threat to petition, uh, 
petitioner's right to life, dignity and health under the constitution. So this judgment clearly brings out or establishes the IP protection and enforcement should not compromise uh, the basic human rights including um, right to health. There was also successful mobilization in the, uh, in, in the, la uh, in, uh, you know, in the last uh, uh, 16 months uh, on various issues, but two of these I would like to uh, mention here. Uh, the first one is on the mobilization on EU India uh, against the EU India free trade agreement, which con uh, consists of an uh, IP chapter which potentially goes beyond TRIPS obligation. India is important because most of the uh, generic supply come, uh, of medicines comes from India. So therefore it's important if any change in the law uh, may have a global impact on the supply of generic medicines. So as a, uh, therefore uh, a, a global uh, day of action was observed in uh, last February. So where protests were held in more than 12 countries asking government of India not to compromise on, uh, on, on access to medicines. It also demands EU to drop demands on uh, TRIPS plus provisions, which affects uh, access to medicine, especially dropping of the term, uh, uh, a kind of protection called data exclusivity. So similarly, mobilization is also uh, happening on uh, trans specific partnership agreement. So some of our colleagues are here who are uh, spending most of their time on this work. Um, another important, um, important, uh, a mobilization happened uh, is on the uh, plan variety protection le uh, proposed legislation by the IDPO. IDPO stands for African Regional Intellectual Property Office. So this is a new trend which uh, we are uh, seeing in, uh, in Africa. In many, there is an attempt to uh, provide UPO type of plan variety protection at the regional level and even at the country level. So there is, a, uh, there is an effort uh, to, uh, to, to bring this kind of legislations. This in a way resembles, uh, say in 2008, 2008, 2009, we witnessed uh, cropping up of anti-counterfeit legislations in Africa. So similarly now, there is a plan variety protection is happening and uh, we don't have the evidence, but people speculate that this has something to do with a, uh, an initiative called AGRA an agriculture initiative mainly funded by uh, Gates, uh, Gates Foundation. So people uh, will have to uh, look at that and find out whether there is a connection between the Agra initiative and the cropping up of, uh, uh, cropping up of uh, uh, plant variety legislation in Africa. So now let me uh, end with uh, you know, some uh, sort of whistle blowing. Uh, the first thing is that uh, there is a slow progress on the implementation of WIPO development agenda. There is a resistance from the secretary to change and uh, and change uh, their, the way in which they conduct the business. And in order to mainstream the uh, development agenda recommendations, um, there is a consistent resistance from the secretary. And this resistance uh, from the secretary also gets silent support from the group B countries. As part of the develop uh, agenda project, various studies have been conducted, and some of them are really good work. However, there is a need to translate findings of these studies and deliberations into concrete actions, especially in the day-to-day -day work of WIPO. So there is a resistance to that, and there is an urgent need to have a stock taking of WIPO's functioning after the adoption of uh, Geneva Declaration of the Future of WIPO, and also looking uh, officially there is going to be an independent evaluation of the implementation of development agenda. So th th there is an important need uh, to uh, for the uh, civil society as well as on academia to monitor the functions of WIPO, especially on three areas. Implementation of development agenda, technical assistance program, there is an independent review which has come out, which has pointed out a series of uh, loopholes in the way in which WIPO carry out its uh, technical assistance. And technical assistance, as you know, is the weapon uh, to, to uh, push the IP maximal list agenda. And also activities in the area of IP enforcement. Uh, WIPO is receiving currently uh, funding from the uh, uh, US government to, uh, to enhance the IP enforcement activities in various countries. And secondly, IP enforcement initiatives uh, in international and regional organizations are all happening in different names irrespective of setback on ACTA. Recently, a, WIPO do uh, a WHO document mapped 16 organizations having a work program in the area of counterfeit medicines. So US government is pouring funds uh, for many of these IP enforcement uh, in, uh, initiatives in various international organizations, especially on Interpol and um, WIPO. Thirdly, 
a growing number of voluntary licenses with restrictive conditions were promoted uh, uh, to, in the name of uh, uh, you know, uh, promoting access to medicines. Voluntary license is promoted as an alternative to the compulsory licenses. However, voluntary licenses cannot bring the real competition in the market. And it's a co-option strategy by pharmaceutical MNCs. Concerns have expressed uh, on this uh, so-called public health friendly voluntary license promoted by the medicines patent pool. These voluntary licenses are also attempting to deny access to medicine at equitable terms to people in the middle income countries. I understand uh, civil society organizations in Brazil also express concerns on the voluntary license ended between the Brazilian public sector companies uh, with pharmaceutical MNCs to facilitate local production. The response uh, for uh, against a voluntary license is, uh, should be um, interrogate and mobilize and resist the voluntary license instead of accepting it as a reality. So certain people say voluntary license is going to stay here, so let's live with it. So it's, that's not the idea. We should look at it and we should interrogate uh, the, the idea of voluntary license. And lastly, MNCs in their desperation may invoke bilateral investment treaties against the use of public interest safeguards in the IP law. LA Lilly already has sent a threatening, uh, sent a notice to uh, Canada citing expropriation clauses in the investment chapter of NAFTA. NAFTA. LLLE is uh, disturbed by the Canadian court's interpretation and application of patentability standards with regard to two of their drugs and which resulted in the, uh, in the rejection of patent application for these two drugs. So this might be used in, 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 in uh, uh, many other countries. Uh, recently I, I found uh, the legal uh, advisory page of uh, uh, White and Case uh, saying its claims uh, to use bilateral investment treaty provisions against uh, the compulsory licenses uh, in India. If the compulsory license uh, uh, activities are increasing, then you can use uh, bilateral investment treaty provisions against that. So uh, this, uh, this is a real threat uh, in the coming days. So in, uh, let me conclude by uh, putting a set of uh, uh, suggestions for a future work. 